Have you ever been chasing calisthenic skills and attempted to improve your strength at the same time? But instead of becoming an absolute beast that can front lever and planche and iron cross whilst pulling and dipping more than your body weight, you struggle to make any progress at all, or even worse, you get injured. No! Anyway. Personally, I've been able to achieve skills like the muscle up and the one arm pull up, and I've taken specifically my pulling strength to almost an additional 100% of body weight. By the way, if you want to learn how I did this, check out this video right here for a complete step-by-step -step system. But lately, I've been wanting to spend more time learning static skills at the same time as keeping up with my strength training. The obstacle here is finding a balance between skills and strength work and devising a program that allows you to actually progress at a steady rate without stagnating or getting injured due to overtraining. However, recently I've been using a program that achieves just this, allowing me to progress with my strength and my skills at the same time. Nice. And the best part is, we can alter this program so it suits your particular goals, whether that means working on skills and strength equally 50-50 or prioritizing one over the other. So with that said, let's get right into that system. If you truly want to skyrocket your progress, click the top link in the description down below and join our brotherhood of passionate athletes that all want to take their strengths to new levels and unlock awesome skills as well. In the community, we have live calls, courses, monthly challenges and more. So join now whilst we still have the chance. Click the top link in the description down below and I'll see you inside. Cheers. All right, guys, let's get straight into the full skills and strength training system, starting off with the first component, that being skills training. So let's get right into it. First and foremost, what are we gonna do for our skills training? Well, this depends on your goals, right? But what I'd recommend is that for your push days, you do handstands or you do planche holds. So focus on one of these, don't do both at the same time because we wanna keep it somewhat narrow, right? But you can have one pushing skill and one pull skill that you do at the same time. So on the pull days, this will be the front lever. Now on leg days, and I do recommend that you have some leg days because believe it or not, even though we don't train particularly much legs in calisthenics, it is nice to have in a more holistic program. So, during your leg days, what you can do for your for your skills training is that, is that you work on handstands because they're pretty low maintenance in terms of how much fatigue they they uh, sort of uh, contribute to your overall program. You could do pistol squats, and in addition to this, I recommend that on your leg days you work on what your particular lower body weakness might be. So whether you have weak ankle mobility, you have poor knees in terms of like your knees are pretty weak or your hip mobility is not really that great, or your low back's weak, whatever have you, I'd look into doing some work for your weak area or areas. Now, let me know if you want a separate video on this, because this is a huge topic in and of itself, but I just wanted to introduce it here briefly, as it is smart to do during leg days. Now, our priority with these skills are going to be to work on balancing in static skills, as opposed to strength-based skills. And this is because in this program, what we're going to manage is doing skills, and strength work in the, in the program at the same time, right? So if we're doing strength-based skills, it's gonna be really difficult to then do a proper strength session, right? So the one-arm pull-up, the handstand push-up, these really like strength-intensive skills are not really ideal if we want to do high-quality skill and strength work in the same program. So I'd recommend, yeah, balancing skills, so for example, the handstand, or static skills like the planche or the front lever. And as I mentioned earlier, our focus is going to be to do one skill at a time, or we can push it to doing one pushing and one pulling skill at a time. But I wouldn't do more than this, because once you have too many things going on at the same time, it becomes a bit of a mess, and you start making very little progress in each. So, remember also that specificity is king, right? When you're working, for example, towards the front lever, which is a static skill, you want to use mostly unassisted static chord progressions. And then you can add in other variations as you sort of go. But many people look into the different exercises and they do front lever pulls with a band, they do front lever banded holds, they do just different dynamic variations and all of this. But the most important thing is specificity, right? Like if you want to do the front lever, the front lever pull up, for example, is coming afterwards, right? Like if you can't do the front lever yet, training sort of front lever pulling variations, that's not the main priority, right? If you want to become good at the front lever, your main priority right now should be to do as many unassisted static or progressions as you can do, whatever your level is right now. And then as you improve, you improve, you make the progressions more difficult, right? But that is your main thing. Doing different poles, doing band drills, all of this, this is extra stimulus and different sort of tools you can use as you like and if you really want to. But that's important to remember that specificity is king. So, 
when do we want to do our skills training? Personally, I'm a big fan of doing it in the morning or the first half of the day. Alternatively, you could do your skill training before you do your strength training in the same session, but that's not what I do, at least not currently. So when we're talking about doing it in the morning, I feel like it's a really nice way to combine combine sort of the movement skill practice with just waking up and like getting into morning movement, just getting started. Because usually when you wake up, you sort of your body's a bit iffy, right? You need a bit of a bit of movement to get going. And I feel like that's a brilliant way to sort of combine these things. You wake up, you do a few light stretches, some dynamic stretching, some movement, just get your body started. And this can be combined with a warm up for your skills training. And then you start your skills work and you're just straight into it like that. And you might wonder why we want to do it this way, but it's all about doing skills before strength. This is the entire thing we want to build this upon. Because skills require us to be fresh. Because this way, when we're fresh and going into our skills training, we can ensure that we're working with the correct movement pattern and that we have good technique. So we reinforce the right movement patterns, we reinforce the correct muscle activations, and we actually work efficiently towards the skills that we want to achieve. Now, when it comes to volume, what I'd recommend is doing more or less 15 to 30 minutes of handstand holds. If you are doing handstand as your as your main pushing skill, or as your pushing skill, you shouldn't do more than one at the same time. I'd, I wouldn't recommend it. But uh, yeah, here you can do 15 to 30 minutes of handstand holds with just small rest in between. And then you have 5 to 10 front lever or planche holds if you're doing front lever, for example, for the pulling or, or the, and, and the planche for the, for the pushing. And here you want to hold around six to eight seconds minimum, or well, six seconds minimum and around six to eight seconds for, for hold time. You can scale this up further, right? And that's what you'd have to do in order to get to the next progression. But this is sort of a good range to be in to build that static strength. When it comes to rest time, when you do the handstand, if you like if you do balancing drills, what you can do is stick to like one to max two minutes in between right during the 15 to 30 minute window you have in the morning let's say for for handstand practice you just you do practice practice drills right you, you do balancing drills and then as you get tired you take a minute rest or you take two minutes rest and that's just how you keep going right but handstands pretty low maintenance so unless you do something like max holds in which case you might want to go for two to four minutes right a bit longer rest times it's not really a big problem you can be quite active and you can do quite a few handstand holds and balancing drills before you need significant rest right so we can have shorter durations of of, of these uh, of these resting periods but when you're doing front front lever and planche you might want to have a bit longer rest times if you do really really solid holds i recommend somewhere in the uh, in the range of two to four minutes for for your rest times three to three minutes can be a pretty good sweet spot now a bit of an easter egg i'd want i wanted to include for skills training is that Everyone wants to achieve the skills, right? And to look cool and do the front lever and the planche and all of these things. Sure, that's not really something new. But if you're serious about your training and you really want to excel to the next level, you should include the following. That being protraction on push days and retraction on pull days. And you might say, Jacob, what do you mean by protraction and retraction? And this is crucial within calisthenics. I'd go as far as to say this is the biggest thing you've got in calisthenics, right? Protraction means that you're able to separate your shoulder blades and have them protrude forwards, whereas retraction means that you're able to bring your shoulders back and sort of pinch them together, right? Protraction is what you need for good pushing, and retraction is what you need for good pulling. And together, if you can do these these well, both the protraction and retraction, you have really good scapular ability, which is key in calisthenics. So... I might make a separate video on these things as they're crucial for becoming a true bodyweight G, right? Comment down below if you want to see this, so I can sort of bump it up in the, in the pile of upcoming videos. But basically, the bottom line here is that if you want to level up your strength and skills, becoming a master of protraction and retraction should be on the top of your list of priorities. What I'd recommend is that you add in a few sets after your skill work during the morning session to work on protraction when you do have your push days and retraction on your pulling days. And what you do then is for the protraction, I'd recommend working on the protracted push-up. So you're really getting that emphasis, emphasized protracted position whilst you have depressed scapulars. And for retraction, I'd recommend the perfect pull-up or body weight rows where you really focus on maximal retraction. 
So that leaves us to our strength training. What are we looking for in terms of strength training? First and foremost, I'd recommend doing one primary exercise per movement category. So one push movement and one pull, pull movement, which is the main movements right this ties into less is more right this concept of like if we truly want to make progress and make well make significant progress we can't be doing a hundred different things at once we need to find the few things that sort of matter the few things we want to level up and really focus in on those things now obviously in addition to the primary movement you can add in one to two supplementary movements to sort of fill in the gaps explore some other movement patterns gain some stimulus for, for, for other muscles that are less stimulated during our main movement, be careful with overdoing it, right? Focus and specificity are really important. And when you're doing strength training, the main movement you have, that is really the thing that's important to level up from week to week and month to month. The supplementary movements are more just for filling in the smaller gaps. So yeah, the priority with strength training is that we get in few, but intense, high quality sets for our main movement. All right, so when do we get in our strength training? Well, personally, I'm a big fan of doing strength training in the afternoon or evening, or just generally in the second half of the day, right? What you could do is that you could do your uh, strength training right after you do your skill work and in the very same session, but that's not what I'm doing, at least not right now. So why? Again, this comes back to skills before strength, right? When you do your skills, you want to be fresh, like as fresh as you can be to make sure your technique is crisp, it's pristine, it's on point and everything is sorted in that manner but between your morning workout and your afternoon or evening workout your body can sort of rest and recover you've got some time right you'll have to do a separate warm-up during the uh, afternoon evening session right to get started on the strength training but you sort of have a good space in between where you can sort of refuel right you can eat the sort of things that they can provide you with energy to, to for your second workout and um, you can prepare for it in that manner and also you can do a power nap in between or something, or even a longer nap if you're really all about that training. So multiple, multiple options right here. All right, so for our push specifically, when it comes to the push category, what are we looking for? What I'd recommend is that for your main movement, you choose to do either weighted dips or overhead press. And if you have difficulties choosing which one, I'd say weighted dips are pretty all right for doing the planche. They go pretty nicely together. And the overhead press is pretty darn good for the overhead, sorry, for the handstand push up so depending on what you have as a go depending on what you do on the skill side of things whether you're training for the planche or you're training for the handstand i'd recommend sort of going accordingly with with the strength training now for the supplementary exercise or supplementary exercises i'd again be careful with the volume here but what i recommend primarily is that you do the sort of inverse of what you do for for your main movement so if your main main movement is is the way to dip I recommend doing some overhead pressing for your supplementary exercise and vice versa. If you mainly do overhead pressing, I recommend getting in some weighted dips, although lighter, in as, as a supplementary exercise. Alternatively to this is that you can do some extra protraction work, right? So not pronated, but protracted push-up, right? If you haven't done so during the morning session. But uh, yeah, above all, like make sure that the supplementary exercise does not hinder strength gains by hindering max performance on the main movement, right? This is really important. Whatever you do in terms of your supplementary work, like people have different thresholds. You might be able to do a lot of extra volume and do, be fine if anything, like do, do do really well because of that. But some people need less volume and less volume of the less important things, right? The main thing is that you improve in your main lift. So just make sure that your supplementary exercise, that you don't do so much volume and go so intensely with this that you cannot perform adequately during your main lift. So that being like your overhead press or your dip, right or, or, or you're pulling or, or on the pulling side of things as well as we'll get to so yeah it's all about really specifying here what you really want to go for right be clear about your goals because you won't make optimal progress with strength and skills if you're also trying to train for hypertrophy or endurance or all of these other attributes right if you want to make more progress you have to make your scope of uh, sort of your goals and your your training program more narrow that's just how it goes all right, so for the pulling side of things, what I'd recommend is that for the main movement, you stick to either weighted pull-ups or weighted chin-ups. Now, weighted chin-ups tend to be better for one-arm pull-ups, so if you really want to go after the one-arm pull-up at some point in the, in the near future, I'd recommend doing weighted chin-ups. But weighted pull-ups do have a greater transfer, generally speaking, to other pulling skills, so the conventional muscle-up and front lever, and they also have better transfer to climbing, that type of thing, so pick your poison. Now, for the supplementary exercise or exercise this, here I'd recommend going for the perfect pull-up, doing some body weight rows if you're not doing this in your morning program, some weighted hangs, or some bicep or forearm 
work, right? So if this is a weak area for you, it'd be nice to work on those biceps a bit, especially if you're not doing weighted chin-ups or weighted pull-ups, and perhaps your forearms could use a bit of extra work as well. So perfect pull-ups are great for getting that retraction in, right? Or you could do weighted shrugs. These are both great options, but here weighted shrugs would of course be weighted shrugs on the bar, right? Not just like you're doing a barbell shrug or that type of thing, but ideally weighted shrug like you're hanging from a bar and then engaging, so going from a passive to an active hang. Also, as previously stated, right, make sure the supplementary exercise does not hinder strength gains by hindering max performance on the main movements. This is really important for push and for pull, whatever have you. You need to make sure that the main movement is what you keep progressing at, right? Again, it comes back to those goals, right? Like if you, if you are optimizing for strength and skill, sort of something in between those two goals right there, you can't also bring in hypertrophy training and endurance training and all of these other things because it will slow down progress towards what is supposedly the main goal of achieving greater strength and greater skill gains. So if you're serious about taking your pull training to the next level, you can click this video in the cards right now and learn about the best pulling accessories for, for strengthening your weighted pull-up training and to maximizing your performance. Also, if you want to check out this video right here, you'll learn about the complete system I used to get to a roughly 2x body weight pull-up. But when we look at the programming for strength, what are we really looking for? Well, I'm a big fan of the step loading system. So going from 3 to 5 sets of 3 to 5 reps. What does this actually look like in practice? Well, first session you go into the gym working on, for example, your weighted pull-ups. You go in and you're supposed to then do three sets of three repetitions per set at a particular weight. The next time you enter the gym again and you're supposed to do a pull day, you now perform four sets of three repetitions per set. Next session you enter the gym again, this time you've bumped it up to five sets, but still of three repetitions per set. Next session you come into the gym again and it's a pull day, you do three sets now again, so back to three sets, but now four repetitions for each of those sets. Next time you go into the gym, you now perform four sets, still four repetitions per set. Next session in the gym, you now perform five sets, still four repetitions per set. After this, when you come back to the gym again, you now go back again to three sets, but this time with five repetitions per set. After this, you do four sets of five reps and then five sets of five repetitions for your sort of ninth session, right? If you think about all of these being a particular individual session, then we're at session number nine right here. After this, you go back to three sets of three for your session number 10, right? And what you do at this point is that you add a weight increment. So whatever you did for for, for your weight here during the um, during this cycle, th this the weight would stick you would have the same weight for all of these different sessions and then as you hit five sets of five reps the very next session you go session when you go back to three sets of three reps you'd add on 10 kilos or perhaps a smaller weight increment but then you'd make a larger weight increment and then you'd keep going with the cycle from the beginning again from three to three from three by three to, to five by five and then you'd add another weight increment and so it goes so it goes so yeah, smaller weight increments over time, this is sort of an important detail to, to remember, is that the more cycles like this you go through, the more weight increments you go through, the smaller the weight increments will be over time. At least if you want to have all of these happen in sort of nine sessions roughly, right? If you want to stick to the same duration of, of, of a cycle, right? If you don't want to add in a bunch of other steps, if you don't want to have a larger range for your sets and, and rep numbers, right? Then you'll have to eventually make the increment smaller. So perhaps for the first one or two cycles, you're able to add a full 10 kg. Then after that, maybe you'll have to go down to 7.5 kilo, or for example, eight kilos if you're using kettlebells, that's usually like a nice, uh, a nice differential, two, four, eight kilos. These types of things are nice to sort of find, find depending on what kettlebells are available. And then after that, you perhaps go to five kilos, that type of thing, right? But note that this is if you stick to the same set and rep ranges. Of course, there are, there are ways of tweaking it up and making sure you stick to larger weight increments. But then the cycles will have to gradually get longer and longer and longer. So I recommend just sticking to this system right here. Now, note that each weight increment and each cycle will take you roughly two to two and a half months to go through. But Jacob, if it's only nine, nine sessions and... I train twice per week, which I'll cover a bit more in a second. But if it's about that, then why would it take two to two and a half months? Wouldn't it be just a month, a month and a half? 
well, this is how I look at it, right? You have all of your training weeks, they take a certain amount of time. If you do two sessions a week, they take roughly five weeks. But then you might have one to two deloid weeks, we'll talk about this soon. We might need to just like take it easy, right? Drop intensity, like take take, an e take a week or two where you have easier load and you sort of like rest a bit. Then you might want to do one to two sessions to build back up after you've had a deloid week. Right, And then you might also want to have a few extra sessions in between there to sort of do a repeat of a particular session. If you've, Because like our performance goes up and down, right? If you had a particular session where you were supposed to do four sets, or four repetitions per set, but you could only do, maybe you could do four reps on the first set, then three reps, and three reps, and then two reps, you had a weak session. Perhaps something was off, you're really stressed out at work, right? Like whatever happened, you just your performance was way off. Perhaps you want to do a repeat of that session. Right. So like because of all of these factors together and conservative estimate is that it takes you two to two and a half months to complete a cycle and to increase weight. Then when it comes to rest times, I see people messing this up a bunch. So what I really want to emphasize here is that you rest for minimum three minutes. Less than this is rather ineffective when you're doing strength work. Now, you don't need to do monster monster rest times of like 10 minutes or even like six, seven, eight that type of thing. But I really recommend taking to minimum three minutes and a good cue to know when you're sort of ready to when you're sort of ready to to finish up your rest period is that you're physically and you're mentally ready for the next set right if both of these are sort of checked off by the time you've rested for let's say four minutes or four and a half five minutes then you're ready to go back up on the bar so don't worry too much about how many minutes you do just make sure it's more than three that you actually have some rest in between your sets and then just go up to the bar again or up to the or up to the dip bar when you are mentally and physically ready to do, to do your next set. Now let's go over some rapid fire programming. So just like outlining this entire thing, bring it all together, skill and strength work both. So what I recommend is sticking to four days of training per week. This being two days for push and two days for pull. This leaves you with three extra days per week that aren't really dedicated to anything right now. And those days can be used for training your legs, recommended, doing some cardio, for example, or just having some extra rest, etc. right? So lots of options there. You can fit in other things there, but make sure the overall program does mainly support two push days and two pull days. Once you're doing a bunch, a bunch of extra work, if you're really fatigued for your pushing and your pulling work, obviously it's going to be more difficult to see progress within these categories, right? And the order we want to do these things in is that if we're looking at sort of a weekly structure, we want to do our push work before we do our pull work, right? So we want to have push days before pull days, generally speaking. If you really want to specify for pulling, then, you know, obviously you can do your pulls before you do your pushing. But generally, for the general athlete, pushing before pulling is a good way to go because if your lats are fresh and you haven't exhausted them yet with your pulling, then you have a better base of support for your pushing, whether that be your dips or your overhead pressing. Whereas if you've had, for example, day one is a pull day and your lats are fatigued to day number two, and day number two, when you're supposed to do your pushing, your lats are tired and your base of support is weaker, so you'll perform less optimally, right? So with this in mind, this is pretty much the program that I'm running right now. Monday is a push day. After that, we we're pulling on, on Tuesday. Then Wednesday is a leg day. Thursday is a day off, or at least a day with most strength or skill work in particular. And Friday, we go back to push. Saturday, pull. And then Sunday is a rest day. This works pretty darn well for me. I get two push days, two pull days, I get one leg day, and I get two days of rest, so I can perform quite darn well during my actual sessions. Then, when it comes to the daily session, sort of like from, from day to day, for example, Monday when you have your, your push day or Tuesday when you have your pull day, what I'd recommend, as earlier stated, is that you do your skills work before you do your strength work. This way you have your best possible sort of technique and form during your skill work, and you can rest up between your skill session and your strength session because I'd recommend doing a morning session for skill work and in addition to this you do some protraction and retraction if you really want to level up and then in the afternoon evening so later on in the day after you've had several hours of rest you do your strength work also you could do a power nap in between or you know whatever you tend to do for like refueling well and making sure that you have energy in in the gym and when it comes to the particular session, right, so within a specific session, whether that be the morning session for skills or the evening afternoon session for, for strength, you'd start off with a warm up, then you want to do your skill and strength work, skill or strength work, and then you want to have a bit of a cool down at the end. As for the warm ups, I'd say that 
Here it's important just like elevate your heart rate a little bit and increase blood flow to the relevant joints, right? I've noticed a significant difference in my performance on the days where I actually have a proper, proper warm up. I get my entire body a bit warm and sort of heart rate elevated. And for example, my shoulders, if I have some troubling, troubling shoulders at times where I have an injury I'm sort of dealing with, then it's really important for me to just get blood flow to to, to the shoulders and to really just uh, make sure that I'm warming them up properly. That has a, that has a significant uh, significant impact on how I perform during the actual session. As for the cool down, so after you've done your your strength work in the evening or, or your or your skill work in the morning, I'd recommend doing a bit of a cool down. So perhaps a few stretches, perhaps some hangs, for example, if you're on the pulling front, right? Some butchers block stretches, these types of things to just make sure you're not losing range of motion on your leg days, like. Lots of different stretches for your lower body and legs. Usually quite nice to do. Otherwise, you get quite uh, quite stiff and quite sore the next couple of days. But obviously, it's not a must necessarily. I'd say warming up is more important than doing a cool down. But still, it's nice to do a little bit of a cool down if you've got the time. I.e., read that as if you make it a priority, right? If you make time for it. So, when it comes to skill work, what I'd recommend is is that you do roughly yeah, five to ten sets for for your holds so for your for your front lever work or for your planche work right depending on the pull and push day or if you're doing if, if you're doing handstand work i'd say 10 to 30 minutes as a sort of block a sort of width time frame to to be working on different balancing drills or to holding like for, for a longer period of time is a good window to sort of aim for in addition to this yeah protraction and retraction work for the g's out there if you truly want to become a calisthenics g this is what you should dedicate some good time and attention to now, when you're doing your statics, for hold times, I'd recommend holding for around 6 to 8 seconds. And if you're building up and you're getting closer to 10 plus seconds, you can start to make it more difficult. So go up to the next progression for the static hold. But you should hit minimum 4 to at least 5 seconds, I'd recommend, in the new hold. So if you haven't yet hit that, then I guess I'll just keep leveling up hold times for the for the earlier progression, right? And here it's really important with the specificity, as I mentioned earlier, I really want to hammer this home for you guys. Like, focus on unassisted holds, right? Obviously, for things like the planche, you know, using the bands and stuff, you know, it's, it's quite darn effective, right? When you get to do versions of the straddle and to the full, full, full planche. But for, for example, the front lever, like, do the unassisted version that you can do it right now and spend time there. Everything else, like doing front lever pulls and doing assisted front lever variations and everything... It's just extra tools you can add as you like. And sure, they can be beneficial and you can sort of enjoy some of them more than others and think they're really effective. And it's not that they're ineffective. It's just that specificity is the king, like is, is the key here, right, that we're going for. So it's really important to make sure that if you want to be able to do the unassisted front lever, that you train unassisted front lever progressions, right? And then that you maybe get some assisted towards the end of the session, perhaps then you do some assisted like with the band front lever holds, like four front lever holds, right? For front lever pull-ups, all of these things, sure, they can be nice skill accessories, but make sure that you target the main thing. If you're not training for the front lever pull-up yet, but you're training for the front lever, then most of your sets should be dedicated to front lever work, mainly unassisted, but at least, you know, the holds. So whether it's banded or, un or unassisted, it's more important that you're in that sort of category than, than, than you're doing a bunch of front lever pulls, that type of thing. And then when it comes to rep based work, so if you're doing body weight rows, for example, for your retraction, or if you're if you for your protraction are doing body weight dips, body weight push ups, that type of thing. But th this again, they're not too heavy on the protraction, to be honest, which is why they're sort of in a middle category here. But whatever have you, if you're doing body weight versions of these during your morning sessions to either work a bit on retraction, perhaps a bit up on protraction, but in a lighter fashion. That I recommend sticking to a rep range of 8 to 12 reps more or less. Just make sure that you do slow and controlled reps. And for the rep based exercises that really target retraction and protraction, like the perfect pull up for retraction and the protracted push up for protraction, here I'd recommend really dropping, dropping the number of reps. So going 1 to 5 reps, really slow and controlled, focus on that form and only increase reps. As you, as you really get these things nailed down, as your protraction and retraction get really solid and you know that you're doing them correctly, then you can start to make it more difficult, either adding load or adding you know higher reps, l l larger hold times, all of these types of things. Because you don't want to mess up the form, right? That's the, that's the most important thing. Get form right first and then you can scale them up afterwards. 
Now for your strength work, as we talked about, three to five sets by three to five reps. And then as you complete these cycles, then you do it weight increments of 10 kilos, 7.5, 5, 2.5, whatever you're able to do. But make sure you don't do too large weight increments because usually this isn't beneficial at all. And you'll sort of just be juggling around, trying to make it work. But when in reality, you don't really get too much out of your sessions. And you're scrambling to, to sort of keep up. Then when it comes to your accessory work, one to two movements for about one to three sets each for about five to eight reps per set, right? Less is more though. Make sure that this doesn't overshadow your, your main strength work or, or your skills work for that matter, right? And make sure you do slow and controlled work. This isn't where you get your, your true strength gains from. This is just for working on different movement patterns, stimulating a bit of the other sort of muscles that aren't necessarily as involved as they would be, as other muscles would be during your main lift. And uh, yeah, just to get some different exposure in your training program. Now, when it comes to rest times, quick recap here. For skills, you want to go for between one to three minutes, usually, depending on the skill, right? If you're doing handstand practice, so sort of like different balancing drills, you can get away with just as little as like a minute here and there for a bit of resting up. But if you're doing front lever holds, you're doing planche holds, that type of thing, I'd recommend somewhere in the ballpark of two to perhaps even four minutes. But three minutes is usually a bit of a sweet spot with this. Then for strength, minimum three minutes, as I said earlier, right? Make sure you are adequately rested both mentally and physically to go back up for another set. But yeah, minimum three minutes is a good rule of thumb. Also, another thing that's really important to include into your program is deload weeks. So this is a week where you just do no no training at all, so a rest week, or a deload week in the sense that you just do less intense training. So you might do the same number of reps, same, same number of sets, or just yeah, same number of sets, but a bit higher reps can be nice. But you want to drop intensity way, way down with these that you can actually like take some time to recover during this week, right? And you want to have this deload or rest week about every four to eight weeks. Sure, the range of of how how rarely, how often it occurs might differ from person to person, but I find four to eight weeks would be sort of a nice range to use. And how often you actually incorporate deload weeks depends on a few factors, namely your sleep, your nutrition, your energy levels, and sort of the training intensity, right? So if your sleep is really on point, it's really good, you get a lot of high quality sleep in, your nutrition's all right, it's in fact pretty darn good, your energy levels are high during your set, during your sessions and generally throughout your weeks, and your training intensity, sure it's high, but it's not balls to the walls to the point where you cannot physically comprehend going any harder, then if all of these things sort of align, then you can deload less often, so about every eight weeks. Whereas if your sleep's really terrible, your, your nutrition, your diet's all over the place, energy levels are low from day to day and during your sessions and your training intensity is just really high, like it's hard to keep up, hard to keep up with, then if these things coincide, then I'll do a deload week more often, so about every four weeks. And you can tweak this up and sort of feel it out from uh, from season to season, from month to month type of thing. But it is nice to do these deload weeks to make sure they're not plateauing, they're not stagnating, and that progress is kept high. Now, caution, a bit of a warning here as well, right? Be careful about o overdoing it with supplementary movements. This is really important. You want to focus on the skills and the strength work. So if this starts to overshadow those, then that is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Or like it, it comes down to this, of that if you want to build strength and you want to work on skills, then do so. But you can't also focus on hypertrophy or endurance or all of these other attributes. You can't do so without making your skills and strength training less effective, right? So something to keep in mind. Now, if you want to get a more slow paced, even more detailed guide for the strength training part of the video, consider watching this video in the cards right here. But let's look at personalization, because this is a pretty, pretty interesting topic, right? If we have a blueprint, we have this program now that we've devised, how can you make it fit your particular goals? This is really important to look into if, if you don't just want to follow some generic advice and something that might not work for you, right? So I'll try to cover this as best as I can. First and foremost, though, I'd recommend that you join the community, top link in the description down below, because in the community, we can discuss this, your situation specifically, I mean, right, more thoroughly in live calls. So if you have particular things you want to achieve, if you have particular sort of hindrances and whatnot in terms of how you can set up a weekly program, we can discuss these things here and we can set up the best program for you because it differs for everyone. But there are a few things I wanted to sort of cover, right? Like if you want to have a training program with a bit more of a skill focus as opposed to strength focus, what would you do? Well, you might do something like this. You might in the morning session do about 10 to 20 planche or front lever holds, 
and possibly a few extra sets working on weak areas of a scale, right? So perhaps you'd want to then do some some front lever pulls or some front lever like band assist work or that type of thing, right? Depending on what range you're weak at, depending on sort of specifics that you're weak at, right? Or a particular progression that you struggle more with and other things, these types of things. Bottom line is that you do quite a few holds in the morning. And then in the afternoon or evening when you have your strength sessions, maybe you'd only do two to four sets of weighted dips or weighted pull-ups and you throw in one to two sets of an accessory to keeping it really on the lower side of volume when it comes to strength work. But if you have a strength focus, you really want to push strength, but you're not too concerned with scales, you want to work on them a bit, but they're not the main priority, then maybe during the morning session you have a smaller session and you just do about three to six planche or front lever holds. And for the afternoon or evening session, you do around four to six sets perhaps of weighted dips and weighted pull-ups perhaps even an extra one to two sets working on weaknesses or this would be nice to combine with just three to five so either like doing four to six sets now like a bit higher volume of weighted pull-ups and weighted dips or sticking to three to five still as was the uh, original sort of outline for the step loading system but in addition to that you throw on an extra one to two sets working on your weaknesses for example for your pulling do you, ha do you find it difficult to lock out the rep sort of near the top or do you find it difficult to initiate the movement to begin with these types of things and then at the end of this you might want to throw in two to three or even two to four sets like, of an accessory or two for for the strength side side of things here it comes down to what is sort of your main goal right what you want to specify is sort of what you want to tailor for right so if we imagine that the left side of these slide is, is, is skill work and the right side is, uh, is strength work, you can see that the different slides will sort of exist for different people. Some people might want to just do skill work, no strength work, in which case we'll, we'll probably make a bit of a different program to begin with, but you can sort of maximize for skills as opposed to strength. Other people would want to get a bit of a hybrid in, as we see with the next three, where there's a bit more of a skill focus or where there's 50-50 or where there's a bit more of a strength focus. And some people might just want to go purely for strength, being with, with no skill work at all, right? And also, remember with this that you can do you can do them in the same session if that's the only possibility you have. But personally, if you have the time for it, if you have the ability to do so, I would recommend splitting them into two separate sessions. At least that's what I'm doing right now, and that's what I'm finding to be, I'd say the most uh, the most the most effective for me personally. And if you're doing handstands and you're wondering how would you do this for handstands, well again, it might depend a bit on, on on the person you're asking, but I'd then like for the morning session, if you wanted to focus more on skills, you could do something like 20 to 40, even 50, 60 minutes of, of planche, uh, plan, sorry, of, of handstand work. But if you do a bit more of strength focus, maybe you just want to do 5 to 15 minutes a few days a week. That's also a possibility. But what if you're getting stuck? Because usually it's quite common for people to get stuck and to have problems in, the, in their training. And I get quite a few questions from people about what to do in these situations. And here is what I'd generally recommend to start looking at. First and foremost, you likely have too much junk volume or misplaced volume in your program. So this really comes back to the sort of simplicity of specificity, right? So in order to progress with skills, you need to spend more time on skills. And further, like specifying this further, you need to spend more time on the particular exercises that most resemble the scale you want to achieve. Front lever is a brilliant example, so I'll keep using it. If you want to achieve the front lever, not the front lever pull-up, not the one-arm front lever or any of these things, if you want to achieve a standard full front lever, then the things you can do that are most specific to this would be unassisted front lever progressions, and to be fair, also banded full front lever progressions. Right, full, full banded full front lever. So, doing front lever pull-ups with a band or just like with a regression of, of the front lever unassisted variations, these things are less specific, right? Also, doing different banded versions of the front lever progressions wouldn't be as specific as doing specifically the banded full front lever, right? Or to do then just unassisted front lever progressions at whatever level you're at, right? So, make sure that your volume is sort of placed where you want to progress. If you want to progress with a particular skill, you want to make sure that you're doing actual holds for that skill. And in addition to this, you want to make sure that they most most resemble the, the particular skill you're going for, right? Like whatever that is, whether it's a front lever pull up, whether it's a front lever pull, one arm front lever, you want to have specificity in all that you do in training. Specificity is king. And in order to progress with strength, you need few, but high quality and intense sets. Now, 
if you think that your volume's all right, like you've divided it well between your, your sort of your goals, whether those be skills or strength related, then another thing to look into would be rest and sort of deloads, right? It might be that you're resting too little, so you're sleeping too poorly or too little from, from day to day, or that you have too sparse or non-existent uh, deload weeks each season, right? So make sure that you either increase the frequency of your deloads or increase how much you sleep or increase the quality of it, and that might have quite a significant impact as well. Now, next up, I really want to touch upon this with patience and consistency, because if you're in calisthenics for one to two weeks or one to two months or whatever have you, you won't make too much progress regardless of who you are, right? But if you're in it for the long game, right, you're in it for years and years on end, it's sort of inevitable of course, no, you can you can have it shit program and shit approach and you'll get pretty poor results. But if you're in it for the long game and you have somewhat of a right approach to like how you're programming this and training for it, it's impossible to not make at least pretty all right progress. All right, so what we want to do for this is that we want to have consistency first and foremost, right? You want to put in the work and make sure that you don't do so little that you don't make any progress, right? You want to make sure that you have consistency and that you, you know put, put in the work and you don't fall off the bandwagon. But then you also want to make sure that you pace yourself so you don't go too high up, right? You don't you avoid junk volume, you don't do too much to the point where you rush into an injury, right? So it's all about staying within these two. Having consistency and making sure you're not dropping so far down that you can't see progress because it just doesn't make sense, you're not stimulating for enough. And at the same time, you want to make sure that you're doing not as not so much that you're rushing into an injury or stagnating or whatever have you due to overtraining. So for a bit of a quote that I thought was really fitting for the video is that you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. And I think this is really important because as we get stuck with the different type of programming options and stuff, it's easy to think that, oh, but, but this might have these problems and, and this program might not really fit for this particular reason or whatever have you. But the most important thing is that you won't be able to know what problems arise in a week or in a month or in a year. You simply won't until you actually start. So the most important thing is that you start today, you start as soon as you can, and then you make changes as you go. You tweak things up. Maybe you wanted to change maybe you want to train more for strength or more for skills in a few months than what you do now. And then you just make the changes you make the changes accordingly, right? So the bottom line here is that it's really important to just get started. We're looking at different programming options now to optimize it, yes, but there's nothing to optimize if you haven't begun yet. So make sure that you get out there and you actually start. And then if you want to make more progress than you perhaps could by yourself, pre feel free to join the free community. It's a top link in the description down below. We're almost right now at 200 members. So if you want to be motivated by others that are making rapid progress and achieving great results, right, hitting PRs and making great progress, and you want to share your victories as well, but also you want to get help when you're struggling and you know you want to learn from others that have been on this journey for longer than you, feel free to join, you know, top link in the description down below. And with that said, thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.